Hi, this is James Zhang, and today I'm going to start with a quote. Um, Inefficiency is a necessary condition for superior investing. You should limit your efforts to relatively inefficient markets where hard work and skill pay off best. And this was by um, Howard Marks, and I I can't think of anything more inefficient than asset management or property management. And that, that is what leads the opportunities in uh, multifamily real estate and in real estate in general. And so that is what we're going to talk about today. So, um, you know, a lot of investors right now, there's not a lot of transactions going on. So they're really focused on their collections, their um, man- managed properties that they manage today. So um, that's what I'm going to talk about. I've seen a lot of PLs in my background. Uh, so my background is I, I spent 10 years at GE Capital, um, eight years as a loan underwriter. And then five years, the past five years as a mortgage broker, underwriting um, over 125 multifamily loans, and then also invested in close to 6,000 units across DFW, Austin, and San Antonio. So today we're going to talk about the role of the asset manager. And the, the asset manager is typically, there's a third-party property manager. They get, let's say, 3 to 4% of the revenue. And then there's typically a syndicator um, on top of that, that is typically paid anywhere from one to two percent asset management fee. So, what does the asset manager do? Um, here's the best definition I could find: is pairing knowledge of multifamily operations with forensic financial analysis acumen to maximize financial performance, to set your asset apart from its competitive set by supervising and monitoring the activities of third-party property management. So I thought that was perfect. I'd never seen that um, put out so well. Um, and so as a general partner, as a limited partner, the way I look at the asset manager's job, um, the next couple of slides, I think, are things that general partners should be doing and things that limited partners who are investing in deals um, would want their general partners to be doing. And so some of this information is readily available to you as a limited partner. And sometimes this is only the general partner who sees this information. And sometimes it's even just the property management staff that sees this information. So I wanted to go through some of the things that I look at. So in good times, usually general partners would just send out, um, you know, their reports. And the only thing I would look at is net rental income. So I would look at net rental income on a T12 basis and see how the property is performing. Because what happens is when you go to sell a property, which is going to drive a lot of your return, your net rental income is the most important number, is the number that they're going to take a T3 on, the lender is going to take a T3 on your net rental, and take essentially T12 on majority of the other items or pro forma expenses of the buyer. The only thing Fannie and Freddie cannot take a pro forma number on is net rental income. So as a seller, that is the most important number. And as the owner, that is the most important number um, that you should be focused on and driving right now. So um, net rental income is number one. That's when someone sends me a a package, investment package, typically after the 15th of the month, I just open it up and go straight to net rental income. The second thing I usually look at is the occupancy of the property and comparing where my in-place rents are to market. So The only way you can really do that is if you have a report called unit statistics report, which is um, on the bottom half of the slide. And it breaks out by floor plan, the average market rent, and then average occupied rent. So what you're actually getting, and then how many units um, for each one of those floor plans is occupied, right? So that's the second thing that I would look at is, is there any unit type that is you know, lagging behind the overall occupancy and why that is. And is there anything that we can do to adjust that rent or advertise that, that, that uh, floor plan differently. And then um, we'll also get into this later, but this shows sort of move ins and move outs in the next month. And so, um, all right. So net rental income, rental occupancy, what else should I be looking at? Um, Definitely the, let's just start right at the top. So, this is all the things in revenue that make up your revenue. Number one, um, by floor plan, I'd be looking at um, competitive properties and what they're charging for rent, how much are they billing back, what are they offering those tenants, 
And that's a constant thing. So if you're not getting a market survey from your property manager, from your property management company, I would ask for it. Um, they should be um, surveying their competitors at least once every other week, if not every week, and really getting an idea of what's going on in the market and what trends they're seeing. The second thing is, you know, when you go in, all right, you, you market the property and now people start coming in. How are you going to um, rent to these or what, what rules are you going to have in place? Right. So income ratio, credit scores. Um, are you going to look at past rent, land, landlord tenant eviction records? What are you going to look at? Um, because if you if you go through the process, get someone in and then they end up not paying, then they're going to end up on the delinquency sheet. So that is, that is what we're paying attention to a lot right now in terms of collections, but then also um, the delinquent rent that is outstanding. Um, the fourth thing that I'd be looking at is new leases signed, right? So um, when you go on the bottom left, you can see, you know, where's the prospect source? Is it coming from Google? Is it coming from your property website, drive by? And, you know, is that qualified leads and where should we be spending more money? On the flip side is, you know, someone leases a unit and now you get into lease expirations. So on the bottom right, these are all lease expirations. You know, this coming, the next three or four months in the summer is typically when most people move. So you can see on this chart, like March and April, even May, there's only, let's see, you know, five to 10 move outs. But in June, July, August, there's going to be anywhere from 17 to 23 move outs, even into September. So that's going to be a big month. Those are going to be big months to sign new leases, make sure you um, retain your tenants um, over the next three or four months. So that's on the revenue side. Um, on the expense side, you know, the first thing that almost everybody asks for is the budget. So do you have an approved budget with your property management company? And how is that budget? That sort of gives you the guide rails and how are you comparing to the budget every month? And so here you can see this property management company, essentially every line, I just pulled the top half of the p &L, every line, um, they have sort of what's driving the variance across that and understanding that. And um, the bottom picture is we talked about advertising, but you know, what expenses are you using to drive um, the revenue piece? And this is an example just on the bottom. Like if, some, if someone goes to your website, do they see a picture of not only the property, but the floor plan? Does it show the availability? Does it show your ability to um, lease, lease the unit right on the website? Um, you know, reviewing your payroll. And this is, this is the bigger thing right now is um, understanding your utilities for sure, but then any of those service contracts that you have also. And then um, real estate taxes, we talked about this. Real estate taxes are just coming out right now in terms of assessed values here in Texas. Um, so making sure those are appealed and then insurance renewal. So insurance is going up all across Texas, making sure that's in compliance with your lender's requirements and then optimizing your insurance, sort of shopping that every year. Um, capital projects. So whenever you close a loan, the, the lender typically has what's called immediate repairs. So here's an example to the right, things like whether it's foundations or balconies or GFCIs, um, those are things, parking lots is a big thing. All those need to be done in the first six months um, from when you close the loan. So getting on that, making sure all those are complete and drawing all that money. So the second thing is sort of what's your CapEx plan. So a lot of people in the first 12 months, they have a CapEx plan. So here you can see um, on the bottom sort of the CapEx on the interiors of this property. And then, you know, they drew in um, sort of, I think that was December, towards the end of the year, they essentially drew all of those reserves back from the lender. So a lot of times the lender is going to hold your rehab money. So you have to front the money, put it into the property, show the invoices, show that the work is done, and then submit for reimbursement from the lender to get all that money back. And so making sure that that's like a constant flow. I, I know some general partners get stuck um, with sort of their working capital. They um, spend a hundred thousand and they can't get it back from the lender and they get stuck in the cycle where they run out of working capital and can't do any more rehab to the property. So make sure you're constantly, whether it's quarterly or even monthly, you know, making your draws from the lender um, to number one, stay on schedule and number one to number two, just to like keep your property in good shape. 
Um, in terms of monitoring, so, um, so we talked about revenue expenses, capital projects. In terms of monitoring, um, I like the idea of going to your property you know, weekly or every other week and doing sort of a visual inspection, but then also taking your rent and roll and understanding um, you know, what units are vacant on the property and walking those and understanding, all right, why are these vacant? Are these rent ready? Do we need more uh, make ready people here um, on the property? And then also just making sure that, um, you know, your rent roll is accurate, right? So we've been, some general partners have told me stories where they've essentially walked vacants and it looked like somebody was living there and they asked the property management, you know, company. And it appeared that like, you know, some of these, some property managers were letting people live in units and not showing on the rent roll. So the money wasn't coming to the owner, it was coming to the property manager. So you just have to keep your eyes open, especially as an asset manager especially when things are going well, sometimes you miss some of the things, but I, I mean, right now is the time to really button down and um, be on top of your portfolio. Um, preparing your annual budget and then really setting goals um, for, the, for the leasing staff out there and making sure that, so we talked about leasing earlier, um, when you set your criteria, making sure that the leasing staff is following the criteria and not just overriding it is another thing that I've seen. And then let's talk about communications now. Um, you know, this is um, huge right now in terms of communicating not only with your lender, uh, but then also the people who provided um, the equity to you, right? So me as a limited partner, I like to see um, everything that you get from the property management company. So here's two examples of, um, you know, 150 to 200 page PDFs that I get. Here's sort of the table of contents with all the things that are in there. Um, you know, it starts with the T12. It has the availability and traffic. It has the rent roll, income statement, T12, cash flow, um, general ledger, um, bank statements. It just shows shows you that your your property is being professionally run and they're not hiding anything. So I like seeing everything. Um, a lot of general partners will summarize it into maybe a one or two page. Um, PDF, but I like having all the backup information there. The third party property management company already provides it. So as a general partner, I would push that out to your limited partners and some of them might not even read it, but I would, I keep all the, um, all my limited partnership um, investments just in a folder and uh, I just download it every month and keep it in there just in case I have a question about something that I can go back to. And then right now communications on collections, right? So people want to know, um, you know, how are we collecting right now in May? How are we collected for April? How's that going to impact? Do we need to take forbearance? So just, I think the communication set of once a month is probably once a week now um, for limited partners just to keep them um, engaged. And I think it's going to separate you as a general partner later down the road. So if you see a deal that pops up, let's say six months from now, it's going to be um, the, the general partners who have communicated, over communicated right now, I think will be able to raise equity a lot easier. All right, this last piece is really on acquisitions and disposition. So as an asset manager, I think one of the um, biggest advantages is that when you do all this work, when you are understanding the market, you're understanding all the pieces of the property, how, you know, what CapEx is driving rents, which what's not, what's the best way to screen? Is this a good market? Is this a good submarket? All of that takes into consideration that all of that should be taken into consideration in your next acquisition. Right, so if you're in a submarket right now and it's just not performing well, no matter what you do, um, you know maybe that's not a submarket you want to be in in the future. But um, like I've seen properties where they are in, they're both Class C properties, and they're just in different submarkets. And right now they're seeing the impacts of COVID dramatically be different in terms of collections. And so when you know when you have that inside information, you have that knowledge. Um, you know, this is going to formulate sort of your disposition strategy when you can get out of a deal, but then also your um, acquisition strategy going forward, right? Like what submarkets you want to be in long term. So if you like this video, subscribe um, to the YouTube channel, like this video. And um, if you have any questions about your next multifamily deal, whether buying, selling, refinancing, um, you can reach out to me on uh, via cell phone or email. And then to see all my loan closings, you can go to txmultifamily.com. Thanks a lot.